Okay, today we're going to look at chapter 4 in our book, which deals with isomers. Now, technically speaking, it is a short, shorter lecture than the previous chapters, but this is some of the more complex stuff we're going to have. So, uh, look for a lot of example-type problems in the practice test, so where you can actually have a chance to, to see how some of the stuff is done, because this is some of the more confusing aspect of, of organic chemistry. This is typically the area where we actually um, have the most difficulties. And it is because of this weird term, isomers. Now, technically all an isomer is, is a different way of putting stuff together. So, they, we've already seen some. Like, we've actually talked about uh, methanol, or ethanol, sorry, and um, dimethyl ether, even back in Chem 1, because it talked about our um, intermolecular forces. But technically, both of those had that formula of C2H6O. And that's all it is. They have the exact same chemical formula. They're put together differently. We call those isomers. Now, we're going to break this down into a little bit more fine-tuned because turns out there is a different set of isomers. Constitutional isomers are ones like the, meth like the ethanol and dimethyl ether where they're put together differently. Um, many carbohydrates are that way. Uh, all carbohydrates have the same basic ratio of one carbon for every one water, but when you get to um, six carbons, there's a lot of different ways to put that together to make something totally different. Glucose and fructose both have that same exact chemical formula, yet they're functionally quite different. All right, but we're going to see constitution isomers make up a large majority of this, and they are just flat out put together in different ways. Stereoisomers are a little bit more restricted on how they're put together. What I mean by that, we introduced this, these two in our last chapter, cis dimethyl cyclohexane and trans dimethyl cyclohexane. And it turned out because of how the chair conformers were, remember our chair conformers, like this one where they're both up, um, I would have a CH3 up, and in the other person, the CH3 is up. So I would have one equatorial and one axial. Yet, if I do this chair conformer, I'll draw on a different part of my tablet so I can make that look right. Make this one go down. Make this one go up. And I could have both of those methyl groups on uh, the equator or equatorial position. Well, technically speaking, um, I could have actually drawn either one of those without the wedges and drawn them some, looking something like that. Yet we clearly see these are two totally different molecules. Cannot turn one into the other without breaking a bond. So they are different molecules. So what we are, we're saying is stereoisomers are going to be different in how the atoms are arranged. Not what they're connected to, just how they're arranged. So since we have four places coming off a of carbon, there are other places you can put the thing or that you're talking about, and that can create a different arrangement, stereoisomer. Now, we're going to actually spend a lot more time on stereoisomers because there's two main types of stereoisomers we see. Our two main types are ones we've seen before, cis and trans, deal with double bonds, and the fact that that double bond doesn't ro rotate, and then the new thing is asymmetrical carbons. So there's going to be certain centers or carbons that would actually uh, be asymmetrical just because the sheer number of, of ways we can put things off of it. Uh, four different uh, locations off a of carbon, there's four different things off that carbon, it creates an asymmetrical center. So we're going to expand these bottom two, because we've actually talked about constitutional isomers multiple times. We're just going to work this chapter mostly on these stereoisomers. All right, the first one we're going to talk about is cis and trans. Now, cis and trans is just comes from the fact that if you have a pi bond, a double bond somewhere in a molecule, because of the nature of a pi bond, it stops this bond from rotating. Since that bond can no longer rotate, if you put two hydrogens on one side of that molecule, they're always on that one side of the molecule. And the only way to get it where they're on opposite sides would be to break the bond and reform it. But you'd have to break a double bond. Um, that's going to require a lot more energy than just a bond rotation. Okay, now the names we typically use, especially when there's a backbone, is just cis and trans. So if you look here, we have a carbon backbone going along this. 
So I'm going to introduce how we go how to name this particular molecule now. Because we're just going to take the naming rules that we've already learned and add a functional group to them. All right, what I mean by functional group, that double bond, even though it is a carbon-carbon bond, it's different than the carbon bonds we've seen before. That is the functional group, the double bond in this case. All right, now, I would actually give the name um, based on the number of carbons. So both these have one, two, three, four, five. So they both have the, pre the, the starting part of the name as pent. But what will be different is instead of ending in A-N-E, the double bond tells us to end in E-N-E. So these are both pentenes. All right, now pentene, the E and E just tells you a double bond is. We also want to use a number to tell us where that double bond starts. So it's just a single number, and we want it to have the lowest possible number. So we could say the double bond starts at 1, 2, or it started at 1, 2, 3. So these are both two pentenes. And then, because the backbone goes up, or the hydrogens are on the same side, we would call this one cis, two pentene. This one, the H's are opposite. This is trans, two pentene. And just like the alcohols in the last chapter, we will see that this is also known as cis pent. Pent. That's not supposed to be there. Pent two ene. And this one would be trans pent two ene. I'm not supposed to have a dash there. Okay. Now, we do see chemical properties get varied here. And it mainly is because the orientation of whatever groups they are, since it makes it ridges, rigid, we can actually create a dipole moment. So even though this is pretty much nothing but a um, carbon-hydrogen bond, and in car it's just nothing but a, a carbohydrate, the fact that it's now rigid does create a slight dipole. Now, it's never going to be very big if it's nothing but carbons, but that slight dipole in affects the boiling points. So, uh, move over here, and the dipole pretty much goes away because those forces are neutralized, and we see that boiling point being a little bit lower. Now, if I put something on there that has a much stronger dipole, so like a halogen on there, since a lot of halogens are a lot more electronegative, um, we actually do see a bigger increase in dipole moment and therefore a bigger increase in the temperature. Okay, excuse me. Next thing we want to talk about is the fact that not all alkenes or carbon-carbon double bonds have cis and trans. Sometimes you're just going to name them. Like both these would not actually get any special name cis or trans and it's mainly because those two are the same thing. Wouldn't matter if I flip them. If I flip it up and down, it's still the exact same thing. So this one, we just have our double bond here with a single substituent off of it and no cis or trans. To name this one, we would say this is the number one position because that's where the double bond starts. So this is a two chloro, uh, one propene. And here's something interesting. Because I'm going to say my name we just wrote is technically wrong. And why would it be wrong? No, because propene could only be one propene. Because if the double bond was over here, that would be the one position. So this should be just two chloro propene. The number is not necessary when it's uh, three carbons or two carbons. All right, but we will need it over here. But see how these two are both the same thing? I could have the backbone going here or up, and it wouldn't make a difference. But that's still going to be a substituent no matter where we look at it. But since they're duplicates, we don't use cis or trans. All right, so we have the one position, and this must be two for the double bond. So name here would be 2-methyl-2-pentene. Okay, how about this type of question? Can we just look at a condensed structure and tell whether or not we have cis or trans? Well, we need to get to where we can. 
Because there are going to be some obvious things. Like, like right now, we're looking at this, and this is the double bond. So we got to look at these two carbons right next to it and just decide, do we have two different things off both sides? And on the left here, we have two different hydrogens. So there's no cis trans there. And we can kind of come up with the name of this one because it's a nice, simple, straight line. Four carbons, double bond starts with the first one. This is just one butene. Now, we could name the second one just as easy, but our two carbons that share the double bond, the one on the left has a hydrogen and a methyl. One on the right also has a hydrogen and a methyl. So it's duplicates of the same thing, but different on this side, different on this side. This one does have cis and trans. Now, can't tell that by how it's drawn, but technically this thing, which is 2-butene, is cis or trans. We just have no idea because I drew a condensed structure that doesn't actually examine or show that double bond. And how about this last one? Can we look and see that it's not? Yeah. 2CH3 is off that carbon. No cis or trans. Okay. There is a small problem with this cis and trans. It doesn't work always, because cis and trans typically applies to the backbone. Well, in both these, my backbone is just right there. It ends at that position. Same over here. It goes up, but it does end. The cis and trans applies to how both sides of the double bond are affecting the backbone, but the backbone stopped there. Yet, if you look at these, isn't this molecule clearly different than this one? Because we've the only way I had to turn the left molecule into the right molecule would be to rotate that bond, and I can't do that. All right, so we're going to have to do a different naming sequence. Cis and trans doesn't always apply. And the other thing, if we actually have a molecule with more than one double bond, turns out we can't use cis and trans there either. So we have to come up with a different nomenclature for when there's more than one double bond or when the double bond is not in the middle of the uh, um, not in the middle of the backbone all right so we have this nomenclature we call the easy system and to a degree it is easy once we figure out how to do it but e and z do apply to how the um, groups go E is closer related to trans, and Z is closely related to cis, and how we decide the backgrounds. And what I mean by that, when we have a Z isomer, we're going to call the high priority sides on the same side. When it's E, the high priorities are kind of like trans, and they're opposite side. All right, so how do we decide which one's high priority and low priority? Well, ages ago, somebody really brilliant came up with this, and they just decided we'll do it based on atomic number. Hydrogen has atomic number one. Bromine is much higher than that. Bromine's higher priority. Chlorine versus carbon. Chlorine is higher. So priority is based on the atomic number. And let's do a sample of that. Wait, my picture's missing. This is the picture I wanted. We want to name this guy. All right, now I did something that could have a cis-trans backbone. So we're going to name it that way. And I'm going to come along here because this tail is longer and go along the backbone. And then I'm going to come up here and make that part of the backbone. Now that is a methyl. I did do a uh, skeletal structure. Um, so I just have this H here that I'm going to ignore. But I'm going to number it from this end because double bonds close to the end. So that's at the third position. So I'm perfectly fine to call this particular structure 3 methyl, and then 2 pentene. And then, since my backbone goes up, I can call this one, excuse me, cis. Backbone's on the same side. All right, but let's say I wanted to do it as if it was that easy nomenclature. All right, so I want to decide the high priority side and low priority side. So it is actually kind of easy on this side because I have an H and a carbon. Carbon has a higher atomic number, so that must be the high priority side. But on this side, I have a carbon and a carbon. 
it looks like a tie. But when we have a tie, what we want to look at is the next things that are coming off of that. So this particular carbon down below is nothing but hydrogens, yet this one has two hydrogens and one carbon. So this carbon up here is the tiebreaker, making this the high priority. So on that particular structure, the high priorities are on the same side, so we can actually use the uh, nomenclature with the Z, because Z means same side. So this is allowed to be called AZ, and then 3 methyl 2 pentene. Okay, put this up here because this is a neat little picture out of your book. Helps us realize or see the difference between a conformer and an isomer. So isomers are actually truly put together in a different way. Now, even on a stereoisomer, and a stereoisomer is just where they're attached slightly different, we would see a situation where, um, like, maybe the dog's tail is on upside down. And not drawn upside down, because it would be easy enough to see a tail go down here. But you would know if a tail has somehow been surgically removed. It would look different. The, the fur would be wrong or something. But that's what they're talking about. Or the legs on backwards. It's still the right left leg is in the right location. It's just paws turned around backwards. That would be a stereoisomer. The configurations are really where they're totally put together differently. Um, Conformers, what we saw last chapter, that really is like a dog that sleeps in a funny position. Okay, let's go on to stereoisomers because they are some interesting aspects. Now, a stereoisomer or a chiral object is something that has a mirror image that is different than the original object. A picture of a hand is a great example of this. If, we had a, if I had a picture up here of a hand and you can make out the palm of this one, we really can look at it and say, well, yeah, that, that's a right hand because the thumb's on the right side for it to be a right hand, and we're looking at the palm, that, that, that's, a, that's a right hand. And then therefore the Im mirror image would look like a left hand. But there's nothing I can do uh, to a right hand to make it look like a left hand, except maybe a silhouette of it, because if it's a silhouette when I can't make out the palm, I really can't tell if it's the front or the back. So that's what they mean by chiral. If I've actually given that definition, we can tell the difference just by looking at it. They have this little paddle wheel boat here. Um, with a steering wheel, you're going to definitely be able to tell apart. But down here, these things are non-mirror uh, uh, images. That particular chair, the mirror is going to look exactly the same. A fork it looks the same. Glass, it looks the same. Well, scientifically, we're going to use the term achiral and chiral. Chiral is a molecule that has a mirror image. And achiral is one that doesn't have a mirror image. But we're going to see achiral can be some more interesting aspects to it. All right, so what does it mean on chiral? What I have here is just a single carbon with four separate groups on it. Now, I wanted to actually do every bit of this uh, lecture on paper because that's more idea of how you're going to do it. But to see what's going on here, I'm going to switch over and we're going to look at that Avogadro because I want to animate this so I can show you why this is chiral. All right, so I... Try to make the exact same thing. I have a, a, oh, my screen's froze up. It went to sleep. I have a hydrogen, and then I have a chlorine, bromine, and iodine. And I went ahead and optimized this. But, technically, I have four different groups coming off a of carbon. The reason this is a stereoisomer, I'm going to grab hold of this hydrogen, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rotate it so I can't see the hydrogen. And, let's think about this just being, so this is a fluorine, we're going to call it, are low priority. Chlorine's higher and bromine's higher. So we have a high priority, next, next. They are arranged, if you think about this, in a clockwise direction. The only way I could get the rotation to go backwards priority-wise would be to grab that hydrogen and flip the whole molecule upside down. But now the hydrogen's in the front. So I can't actually reverse the rotation of that molecule without breaking a bond and moving things around. Well, that means this particular molecule has a mirror image that's not the exact same atom. It's a different molecule. All right, but we won't necessarily need to see this on paper or on a digital screen like this or in a model. We really can do something as simple as this. If you see a carbon 
or any atom that has four different things off of it, and I mean I'm just going to use numbers, those four different things are going to create a stereoisomer or an asymmetric center. And that's all we're looking for. Now once we know there's an asymmetrical center, we're going to use those priority rules on real atoms to assign numbers. And then from those numbers, we're going to actually be able to derive, derive a name. All right, so let's look at this so we can identify what it takes to be a stereoisomer. Because um, there are some obvious things to look for once you get more comfortable with it. Like, for instance, these CH3s, there's no way we have to think about them being possible stereoisomers because they have three different hydrogens that are exactly the same. And so think about that drawing we had. If I have the hydrogen in the... In the or actually, let's put the carbon in the back. If these other locations are all hydrogen... It's not going to matter how I have it rotated. It's going to be hydrogen, hydrogen, hydrogen all the way around. Well, same thing happens if I have just two. So let's say I got two that are exactly the same, and this is something else. Well, I can make this look like anything I want because there's two things in a row. So we don't actually have to do a lot of thinking on CH2s and CH3s. There's no way they're asymmetrical centers. So that can limit it. I'm looking at CHs and just carbons because I need four different things. So how about this single carbon? Is this different than an O or an OH? Definitely. Are those two different than an H? Definitely. All right, how about four carbons? Is that different than three? Yeah, it is. Turns out um, straight chains like that can get ignored once we get a little bit past four carbons. So this one, this molecule right here is right on the edge of not showing any signs of, or any obvious signs that it's asymmetrical because these carbon chains are getting pretty darn long and a long chain on either side is almost going to behave the same regardless of how long it is. But being three carbons and four carbons, we should see asymmetrical properties there. All right, how about on this middle one, focusing on just this CH? We have a CH3, we have a bromine, we have an H, and we have a CH2CH3. Four different things. And last one. We have two CHs. This first one is not chiral because I have a CH3 and a CH3. Two identical groups, therefore not asymmetrical. Yet my other CH3 or my other C, H, has a CH3, a CH2, CH3. That is an isobutyl group and then a hydrogen. So four different things. So rather than circle those in, typically what we're going to do is actually put a star on that asymmetrical center or that asymmetrical carbon. And unfortunately on these drawings, there's nothing else we can do. We can't actually fully name these because to actually properly name an asymmetrical center, we need to tell which, which rotation all the things are going. So we need to be able to look at it and tell are the higher priority groups arranged in a clockwise fashion or a counterclockwise fashion. And I don't have any wedges on this. Like they're just simple little condensed structures. So we can't do that. What we need to fully name it is a little bit more of a structure, something like this. We need a perspective formula. All right, what I mean by perspective formula, we're going to have drawings that have wedges and dashes. The wedges are saying we have something coming out at you, and the dashes mean it's going back in. So if I wanted to draw two bromobutane and in, draw in, in a perspective drawing, the perspective drawing is going to show me which one of these carbons is asymmetrical. So let's do a condensed structure real quick of two bromobutane. There's my butane. Two bromo puts the bromine right there. So which one of these carbons is just a CH? It is that one right there. So that carbon I starred is going to be the carbon I just made here. And we have something interesting. When we're fully in control of a stereoisomer, we're typically going to see that we're going to put the carbon flat on the paper. The carbon chain is flat on the paper. So that means that this top one is either this position or it's these two. 
And Brucey, your book, likes to put the number one carbon at the top. So since this is the one position, we're going to put a CH3 there. And on these two, we'll do a CH2 and CH3. And then on these two, it won't really matter. We just need to put one of them the hydrogen and the other one the bromine. And now we've draw, drawn a perspective drawing of 2-bromobutane. All right. Fisher perspective does the same thing, but Fisher perspectives were done by a guy named Fisher back 1800s. So we didn't really have typesets that really gave him a good uh, way of doing this. So to put this in drawings, he actually made these little horizontal arrows. And obviously it doesn't show us which one's coming out at us, but Fisher made a rule. He actually basically said that your vertical lines are always going into the paper and the horizontal, or you know, yeah, the horizontal ones are coming out. Or we could say he was wanting you to imagine wedges, wedges and dashes. And he always preferred um, the most oxygenated carbon at the top. But um, Brucey, your textbook's going to put the number one carbon up there. So one bromobutane would end up looking just like so. With the H and the BR horizontal and the CH3, CH2, and CH3 on the bottom. Okay. Now let's do something weird. I want to look at these two structures, and I want to know if they represent the exact same thing or two different structures. Now, this is something that's kind of interesting way in how it's approached in various different organic textbooks. If you're using almost any other textbook than Brucey, um, there's going to be a section in there where they talk to you about grabbing that hydrogen in your mind and whipping this molecule around so this hydrogen is in the same place as this one, and then rotating the rest of it to see if you match up. Well, interesting, some people can do that, some people can't. I'm not even going to try. I'm not even going to try to teach it. I'm going to show you how you can figure these out by just swapping groups. Because look at this, here's what I mean by swapping groups. Let's pretend like we're going to turn this molecule on the left into the one on the right. So rather than grab hold of this hydrogen in my mind, I'm just going to imagine, well, I'm going to swap these two. And if I did that and drew, it, and drew the molecule, everything else would be the same. But this is now a CH3, CH2, and this is the H. All right, do they match? No. Now I need to swap this CH2, CH3 with this double bond. So I'm going to do one more swap where I'm going to take these two groups and swap them. And if I do that, my resulting structure will be what I have up there. Now, the neat thing about this technique that I'm introducing, it won't matter which groups you swap and in which order you swap them. As long as you make it and do even swaps, so just two groups at a time. If you swap two groups at a time and you do that until you match the structure, um, the... Uh, results will always be the same. So no matter how I do the swaps on this, you will find that you would take two swaps to get to where we got. It always will be two swaps in this, for these two molecules. Well, the nice thing is, if you have an even number of swaps, they are the exact same structure. If it had been an odd number of swaps, then you have the mirror image. And you can do that on any one of these stereoisomers. If it's an even number of swaps, it's always the same structure. If it's an odd number of swaps, it's always different. And your book actually goes through here with some actual drawings, just like we did. But I actually wrote it out on that previous page. Now, the weird thing is, the odd number steps. When we actually say it said on that previous slide, it was the mirror image. The proper term is not mirror image. We use the term enantiomer. And enantiomer means mirror image. But these two happen to be the same exact molecule. They're just rotated differently. All right. Now, here's something interesting. 
when we actually go to name these molecules, we can't tell you if it's uh, rotating clockwise or counterclockwise because we need to actually visualize that to some degree. We're going to use an R and S system, R meaning clockwise, S meaning counterclockwise. And these are the rules to set it up, but rather than go through those and actually detail it, we're going to do one as a trial. So this is that 2-bromobutane we did before. I don't actually have it set up completely the same as we did on paper before, because on before, if you remember, I had the CH3 up here. Now I have a bromine up here. But we can still do this. So we're actually going to figure out the priority of our three groups that are the highest priority. So I'm not going to bother figuring out the priority of the hydrogen. It's always the low priority. But I just need to decide, of the bromine, the ethyl, and the methyl, which has the highest atomic number. Well, it's the bromine. So the high priority is up there. Where's the number two priority? Well, it's one of these carbons, but carbons tie. So on this carbon, we look at the next highest thing, which is another carbon. On this carbon, we'd have hydrogens. So this is the two priority, and this is the three priority. All right, so now we have this nice little thing. We can actually draw an arrow connecting one, two, and three, and we can see that that is counterclockwise, CCW. All right, now, once you figure that out, CCW, you just have this weird little rule. So we actually had our low priority in the back. See how it says down here low priority is not in the back? Well, it's in the back, like ours is. Clockwise means R. Counterclockwise is S. So this particular drawing, it is 2-bromo butane, or pro, yeah, butane. But in front of it, it has... My monitor was going into sleep mode, so if you saw a bright color change, I apologize for you. But I like my white being a little bit white and not, I think that was, that looked like sepia tone, like an antique photograph. <laughs> All right. All right. I have no idea why I have practice with no, nothing on there. All right. Now, our Fisher projections have a similar concept. But remember, horizontal and vertical? Well, interesting, most of the time on the Fisher diagrams, you end up with the four position on one of these horizontal rows. Well, horizontal is vertical. So this can be backwards from what we did, meaning counterclockwise would be R and clockwise would be S. But it's easy enough to remember this when you start practicing. The trick on all of our stereoisomers is to get the rotations right. So get the priorities right first. All right, so um, that's a really horrible looking picture, but I have a chlorine an ethyl and a propyl group, and then the hydrogen. So I'm going to have the chlorine be the high priority because it's high atomic number, and hydrogen is the last one. And between our ethyl and our propyl, we're going to see that that's our two position and that's our three position. So this one, the rotation is clockwise. And the hydrogen's on the vertical row, so the hydrogen is in the back. So clockwise, this is an R stereoisomer. And the full name, my backbone goes right along here. One, two, three, three chloro, uh, hexane, with an R in front, R three chloro hexane. All right, interesting thing happens when we rotate a Fisher diagram. So if you think about this, we could count up the number of swaps, but fortunately in a Fisher diagram, it always does the same thing. And, and what's going to happen is we would see the rotation is going to remain the same no matter what. This would actually be one. That's actually two and three. So the rotation is going to be clockwise. Even here, it's going to be clockwise. But since the rotation takes the hydrogen and puts it either vertical or horizontal, forward or backwards, a 90 degree rotation creates a mirror image on a Fisher diagram. So 
say that one there, that's the mirror of what we just did. No, it's, it's fully rotated. See how the chlorine was up and then down? Here are the chlorines down. So this one is the exact same molecule here. This is the mirror image of it. So this is R, 2, 3 chloro. Did I do 2 before? No, I did 3. Chloro um, hexane. And this one here is S, 3 chloro hexane. Okay. Turns out an asymmetrical center doesn't always give a chiral molecule. Chiral does mean a molecule has a left and right. Um, all chiral molecules do have enantiomers, but it doesn't always result from just one stereocenter. So chiral is not quite the same as saying a um, asymmetrical center. We will sometimes hear the term for a particular molecule, like if I were to go back here. Um, your book tries to call this nothing but an asymmetrical carbon, the central part of a fissure, but you will find some refer to it as a chiral center. Now, any molecule that has one chiral center is chiral. When a molecule has more than one, there's a possibility they cancel each other out. So chiral means it definitely has a mirror, but there are achiral molecules, achiral molecules that have asymmetrical centers. So achiral can have asymmetrical synthesis, uh, centers, asym centers. All right, but talking about the compounds in general, um, if you happen to have that um, R2, R2 bromobutane and S2 bromobutane, you would find they have the exact same boiling point, exact same mel melting point, exact same solubility. Almost all of their chemical reactions are exactly the same. It's very hard to tell the difference between an R and an S of a single molecule. It is possible, but it is very difficult. They do have one physical property that they will do different than the others. Turns out, those asymmetrical carbons will rotate light when it hits it. Now, we don't see this in the real world because light comes in from all different um, orientations anyway. So to make this happen, we have to run light through polarized filter. Now, all a polarized filter is, it's got very, very thin lines. Next time you're at Disney and there are 3D movies, hold your yours and whoever you're there with, hold their glasses up to, towards yours, and rotate one on top of the other. You will see that when they rotate where the patterns cross, they totally black out the light. Technically, that's how we check if something's chiral. We run it through a polarized filter, and then we rotate a plane to see where it matches up, and that way we can rotate how much the light was turned, or how much the polarized light was turned. Um, works relatively well. And it is always a relatively small number, but it's actually very predictable. has a cool little um, um, concept. We actually use a special tube that's typically about a centimeter thick. And when the light hits it, you see the light rotate by a certain rotation. And that is related to uh, the um, um, concentration. And it is this equation right here that we can use. The, uh, um, I didn't bother to find any of these numbers because we're really not going to do any calculations with this. All I want us to know is that you get a certain rotation. All right, now, what I mean by that, you notice how this R molecule gives a positive? That does not mean that all R molecules give a positive rotation. That particular one did. Because it turns out the R and S were assigned by atomic numbers, and this is assigned by how the crystals stack together. That has nothing to do with atomic numbers. It might sometimes be related to chemical physical size, but the atomic numbers aren't necessarily that uh, relationship. So don't expect all R's to be positive. But what we can guarantee is if I give you a molecule, the full name with the letter, and I tell you its rotation is a certain amount, you know for certain that it's an antimer. Its mirror image is the exact same rotation in the opposite direction. They're always the same.
All right, now I skipped a slide on purpose because we're going to introduce another set of terms. So um, D and L are related to whether or not they rotate uh, light one way or the other. Positive light rotation is D, negative is L. Um, you will sometimes see the names of compounds with D's and L's in them. Like this lactic acid that's written, this might be a lowercase d and this might be a lowercase l. Now, most of the time nowadays, you see nothing but positive and negatives. We do see d's and l's, though. Turns out, all biologically active carbohydrates. So, all. We'll have a d in front of them. And technically, if you were to take a uh, uh, glucose, D-glucose, and if you could, were able to somehow obtain some L-glucose and consume it, um, it's likely not going to do anything at all. It's not biologically active. Its mirror image just simply doesn't work with us. But all sugars are D. Now, that has nothing to do with the rotation of light. Turns out all carbohydrates are considered D-carbohydrates because they all reduce to the same three carbon sugar. And this particular three carbon sugar, that rotation, that molecule they reduce to, does have positive rotation. So since they all reduce to that one, we called every single one of the carbohydrates D sugars. But they actually rotate positive and negative. Okay, that optical activity, as needed as it is, it's actually much more important what the heck's going on with the structures themselves. That's how we're going to tell them apart, but knowing that you can actually predict the rotation or that they have rotation just by the chemical structure is far more interesting. All right, so we're going to talk about some of the weird terms that pop up when you have more than one asymmetrical center. So this particular molecule, 3 chloro 2 butanol actually has two carbons that are asymmetrical. So this one could have an R and S, and this one can have an R and S. That gives us four possible molecules. And that's all these are. You notice we got a certain rotation here, and here it seems like it's a mirror of it. These two are definitely mirrors of each other. That's all they've done. They've just moved it around. they figured out different ways of drawing the same molecule to get different rotations. But on this one, they did something kind of interesting. See how this calls this an, an ethro or ethreo? enantiomer and these are 3O enantiomers. All right, where those no names came from is some weird little thing that they've noticed. All right, you notice how the methyls or the backbone kind of do that zigzag pattern, got one up and one down, and same here, it's down and then up. So they're on opposite sides. Well, you notice how the hydrogens are as well? This one's coming out, that one's going in, this one's coming out, this one's going in. So the fact that the groups are all doing the exact same thing, opposite sides, um, we actually call this an e 3 uh, an enantiomer. The 3 O's have them doing the opposite of that. So, got the methyls up and down, but the hydrogens are both on the same side. Up and down, and the hydrogens are both on the same side. 3 O's do that. Now, a little bit more obvious of what's going on here is if we look at these four structures as Fischer diagrams. And that's what we're doing here. You notice how by rotating it that way, and really what all we did to make this structure, remember we talked about how the vertical axes on a fissure was everything going into the paper? Well, let's back up. That was this molecule. How could we turn this into something where all those carbons go into the back? Well, I'm just going to rotate this thing down. That takes this hydrogen and puts it up here, but since it was out coming at us, it would then be going in. So those two hydrogens would be both going in. And that's what we're seeing. They're both on that same side, both going the same orientation. But what Aretho is, it was something that Fisher came up with. He actually was kind of saying that, well, these high priority functional groups are almost in the exact same place. And you can almost view the top and bottom of that molecule as a mirror the high priorities are actually opposite each other. So they're not, inter it's not really an internal mirror, but erythro is very close to having an internal mirror. 
And three is kind of like the opposite of them. They, 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 those two groups do not fully mirror each other. And all these little prefixes actually mean was hydrogens on the same side, hydrogens on opposite sides. All right, now, something neat. neat. One and two are enantiomers. And on our Fischer diagrams, that's kind of obvious, because doesn't this look like a mirror of this one? Yeah. And three and four are mirrors of each other. But one and three are not mirrors. And yet they kind of are, because look at one and three. On one, I have the H and OH, and on three, they are the exact same place. So the top position's exactly the same. The second position where the chlorine is a mirror. So it's kind of got one of the stereo centers is a mirror, and one of the stereo centers is the exact same. Well, when you have that, if you have a situation where you have more than one stereo ice or, or ste one, more than one asymmetrical center, and one is, is duplicated and one is a mirror, you have what we call dysteromers which just really does mean that at least one location is mirrored and another location is the exact same. All right, how about cyclic compounds? Can these have asymmetrical centers? Yeah, they can. Now, more often than not, we use that cis and trans nomenclature because it's a heck of a lot easier to say, well, these are both coming up or these are going up or they're opposite. Cis and trans is very easy to see but it turns out if you think about it this particular location right there is a asymmetrical because I have a bromine coming off of it and the back it's not drawn is a hydrogen and then I have just a CH2 and over here is a CH with a CH3 off of it so we do definitely have four different things and we actually have a rotation going something like this and we even have that here high priority here or priorities go something like that on that one. So we have an R and S, and because of that, that particular molecule is going to have an enantiomer, and it's going to have dysteromers, which is what's going on over here. These are dysteromers of the, uh, well, this one is a dysteromer of the very first one, and this one's a dysteromer of the very first one, because see how the bromine is wedged up? It's wedged up here. CH3 was wedged up, and now it's down. That would be a dysteromer, because one is opposite, one's the same. And we can figure that on all these. Turns out, almost any time you have just one thing coming off a ring, you have an asymmetrical center like that. About the only time it doesn't make a difference, I'm going to change this cis-1-3 to cis-1-4. because it still looks like it must have a stereocenter, but let's think about this location. That would be our high priority. The hydrogen that's not drawn is number two, our, our low priority, but these two would tie, so we'd have to go to the next one, and it'd still tie, and they finally connect to the same thing. So these two sides are equivalent, so that's not asymmetrical. So cis and trans 1, 4 does have a isomer aspect to it, a stereoisomer, but it's not an asymmetrical center. Alright, and that's what we're showing on this. Even though these are two totally different molecules, cis and trans are totally different, since the two sides are exactly the same, the molecule itself is not chiral. Okay, now here's where it gets to be kind of interesting. Turns out the sheer number of asymmetrical center will tell you the possible number of asymmetrical centers. Like this particular thing, this 2,3-dibromobutane has two asymmetrical centers. It's these two middle ones. That could be R and S, and this could be an R and S. So it appears that that having two centers would have four stereoisomers, but it doesn't. And I can actually make you see this a little bit better if I redraw at least one of these as a Fischer diagram. So I'm going to draw it. CH3 is up here. 
the other CH3s here. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to put both H's on one side and both bromines on one side. Because that's a possible, one of our possible in, uh, uh, stereoisomers of 2,3-dibromobutane. Butane. That particular molecule does not have a stereoisomer, does not have an enantiomer, I mean. Now, there, we could draw a mirror of it. Everything can have a mirror image drawn of it, but is that a different molecule? And it is not, because I can turn this one into this one by rotating that molecule 180 degrees. And I did learn that rotating at 90 on a Fisher diagram creates a stereoisomer, or the enantiomer, but if I turn something into an enantiomer, and then it's an enantiomer again, or in this case, rotated 180 degrees, I have the exact same structure. So that particular one has no enantiomer. So this possible doesn't mean they all exist. This particular thing is referred to as a meso structure. Meso just means that it has a, has a, the asymmetrical centers get canceled out. Or another way of thinking about it, we think about this, there's a mirror plane going right through the molecule. The top half of the molecule is exactly the same as the bottom half of the molecule. And whenever you have an internal mirror, you have an achiral molecule. You have a mesostructure. All right. And that's what we're talking about here, because here is all my different ways of doing the 2,3-dibromobutane. All four possibilities. So have them, have the mirror of it. Reversed one but not the other, and then the mirror of that. But these two are exactly the same. Because if you rotate 100 degrees, they cancel out. So that is not a structure that's different than that first one. Now, mesostructures happen a lot. Anytime you can do that internal mirror plane, even on a ring, it works. And here's a weird one. If I go to a um, cyclohexane, if you think about this, this looks like it has an internal mirror plane. So therefore, it's a chiral. But then you're thinking, wait, last chapter, we learned that if I drew this as a chair conformer, even though these are both wedged up, that means one is equatorial and one is axial. And this does not appear to have a mirror plane. And you're right. As a chair conformer, it will not have the mirror plane in it. But the weird thing happens on all these, and it doesn't matter what functional group is on there, the plane of symmetry seems to be related to if the ring was flat. So even if I have a ring that's really held tightly in place, I typically can actually think of the structure as this to decide if it has a chiral center or not. So just imagine your ring is always flat, regardless of how many carbons there are, and then look for that internal mirror plane. If it's internal, then it's, a, uh, um, it's an achiral molecule. And the same thing happens even on our straight chain. You don't have to worry about the fact that the bonds rotate. Because even though this thing is definitely got an up and down mirror plane, yes, that bond fully rotates. So there would be times when they're not mirrored. There's going to be times it's staggered. But it turns out that doesn't matter. If it has that internal mirror plane at least some time, then it's going to be an achiral molecule, even if it has chiral centers. All right, let's actually go on to how we go about naming something with multiple asymmetrical centers. All right, so the first thing I'm going to do is figure out what my backbone actually is without rotations. So, and I'm actually going to do this. Eh, we will go ahead and box it in. Going to have to come along there because the OH has to be part of my backbone. And, okay, so it's just four carbons. It's a butanol. This must be the two position because the OH, and that must be the three. So without any rotations, I know I have three bromo, two butanol. Okay. But I have these two stereocenters that have different rotations. So I'm going to erase these lines because I want to figure out what the rotation is at each location. So I want to know if this particular asymmetrical carbon, carbon number two, is an R or S. And then I'm also going to do the same thing with carbon three. 
All right, so on this first carbon, my high priority would have to be this OH because O has the highest atomic number. And the, and the hydrogen is the four. My two is a tie between this carbon and this carbon. And it must be this carbon because that carbon has a bromine off of it. So my number two carbon has a, excuse me, counterclockwise rotation. Counterclockwise is typically S, and it's definitely S if the H is in the back, which is it, which it is. So I know that the two position is S. All right, the three position, we're going to do the same type of thing. High priority here is the bromine. And if we think about it, two is still this carbon because that carbon has an O and this carbon is just carbon. So if you think about this, this is counterclockwise. So they're both counterclockwise. But on this counterclockwise, our four position, the hydrogen, is coming out at us. It's in the front. So we have to reverse this one. The third position is an R rotation. All right, and then to fully name this, we need to have this S and R, and whenever there are two um, series centers, you put both of them out in front in parentheses. 2S, 3R, 3-bromo, 2-butanol. All right, here's something neat about this. Turns out tartaric acid was one of the first um, compounds truly studied on this stuff and really understood a lot on it. And why the reason it was so interesting to do is because we were able to tell early on that we had a mesostructure, as in the top and bottom had an internal mirror plane. That particular thing, the meso uh, compound, did not actually create any rotated light. That's why this got that zero right there. It doesn't actually do anything because it cancels each other out. Yet what was interesting, they knew that positive tartaric acid and negative tartaric acid were enantiomers uh, or disteromers of that meso compound. So they knew they were related. Matter of fact, there are ways that we can make the tartaric acid and we make all three of these molecules simultaneously. So they knew they were related. Yet um, the neat thing was the positive and negative ones, the ones that rotated light, had the exact same chemical properties. Melting point boiling point was the same, even the solubility. And this thing down here at the bottom that says positive and negative, all that is is a mixture of all three. Typically we find mixtures actually do actually take on properties of all, but the reason the light goes away is because when it's a full mixture, um, these two are in equal amounts. And as much as this one rotates the light one way, this one rotates it the other way. Um, when they are perfectly equal in their amounts, we talk about it being a racemic mixture. Racemic means that enantiomers are equal concentration. And enantomer are equal in concentration. All right, now the cool thing about it when they were first proven that there was a, such a thing as a stereoisomer, it's done by this guy in this picture by hand. All right, so for the most part, if you had R glucose or, or that D glucose I was talking about earlier and L glucose and, chem and looked at them, they're going to look identical. Now, they're not going to taste identical because biological taste is a derivative of those stereocenters, but appearance, they're going to look exactly the same. Yet these two crystals, this is a sodium salt of that ammonium tartarate we just had up there. So very similar thing to what we were just talking about. It's just that we've treated those carboxylic acids with, a, with a, um, um, the right chemical and made it into a salt, an ammonium sodium salt. All right, what was so neat about this particular salt is how it crystal form, how the crystals themselves formed they actually had a unique orientation based on which uh, isomer they were. Or another way of saying it, this left-handed crystal never actually solidified with the right-handed crystal. It created two totally separate different crystals. They didn't crystallize together. So he was actually physically able to look in there 
and see, all right, this crystal pattern goes one way, this crystal pattern goes the other way, and physically separated them. So the very first separation of a racemic mixture was done by hand. We don't do that anymore. That takes way too much time. And think about it. If it's glucose, looks like a sugar crystal, or if it's liquid, it is a liquid, how do we go about separating it? Well, there is a couple different ways. The easiest way, if I'm in a research lab where we're making chiral compounds, and even just an organic research lab at any university, they're gonna have tall columns, like this is representing, but think about this being maybe a meter tall. That could be that tall. And there's gonna be a, um, some beads in here. Now, the beads are typically made out of samples that are chiral. So it's a chemical compound that has an asymmetrical center in it. Turns out, as long as that stationary material is chiral, chiral molecules go through at a slower rate. They, they, some will go faster than others, but you will fully separate your solution that you, so a mixture like that tartaric acid, you pour it, pour it in here, the R and S are gonna come out at different times. And you just cluck the one you want, and now you've purified your racemic mixture. All right, in our lab, if we were gonna do that here on our campus, we could do a chemical reaction. So there are two different two butanols. There's an R butanol and there's an S butanol. Well, that tartaric acid we were just talking about, I'm gonna buy some of that, and we're gonna mix this mixture of those with tartaric acid. Well, we're not ready to see this reaction yet or predict it, but it turns out all that happens is this um, alcohol and this carboxylic acid react together and end up making a, um, a, an ester. Well, the neat thing about the ester that results is it will now have three stereocenters. It's going to have the stereocenters from the tartaric acid, and it's going to have the stereocenter from the butanol. So we're either going to have RRR or we're going to have SRR. Well, these two, even if they're made in one container, have totally different chemical properties. So, even though I can't easily separate these because their chemical properties are identical, I could separate these two substances because they're, they're going to be unique enough, being that they're diastereomers, that they're going to have different boiling points and different freezing points and different other solubility, uh, different other chemical properties. Once we separate them, um, we can deesterify stuff by just adding acid and warming it up. And it will go right back to what we started with, the tartaric acid and the RNS2 butanol. All right, now, right now, I want you to view it as you're reacting. If you want to purify a stereoisomer, you're going to actually treat it with a stereoisomer. So if you want to separate a mixture of isomers that are stereoisomers, you're going to use a stereocenter as a control feature, either as a chemical like this or in a column like so. So achiral molecules don't help. Chiral molecules are what you're wanting to use to separate other chiral molecules. This is just a great example because it's a reversible reaction. All right, um, going to be a lot of practice problems on this, um, but it's not going to be too overwhelming. So uh, make sure you get on top of this stuff. Um, take advantage of the practice test that's going to be up there. There's going to be a lot of redundant questions. So I'm hoping to just uh, flat out overwhelm you. So make it almost impossible to go through the practice test in its entirety. But hopefully, in the process of trying to get through the end of the practice test in its entirety, you'll be an absolute master on all these things, Chiral. All right, last little weird thing. Turns out nitrogen does a little inversion on its own way too easily for it to be stereocenters. So even though a nitrogen, for instance, uh, with that lone pair would be considered possible to have four things, we will find that the lone pair inverts itself relatively easy. And almost any situation, even though we would expect that lone pair to be hanging out in an sp3 hybrid orbital, we will see that the sp3 hybrid orbital that the lone pair is in sometimes behaves like a p orbital and we invert it. Think about this as almost like an umbrella in the wind. It will invert that easily. So nitrogens are typically not viewed as asymmetrical. And even in this case, it doesn't really stay asymmetrical because even though it's got four different things coming off this nitrogen, there's a good chance this H is gonna come off just by not wanting to be there. 
and if it comes off we can invert without actually too much difficulty so you will not actually see too many nitrogen containing compounds that are um, asymmetrical they invert too often and so does phosphorus but that's a little bit more um, maybe organic three uh, most of our uses with phosphorus in this class are more as solvents or reagents and not uh, the chem not for the